state smart contracts and that Sovereign has, uh, you know, through its community now built out um, since launching in April, the ability to trade, to do margin trading, to do borrowing, to do lending, is introducing perpetual swaps, um, has a governance system for um, for the ecosystem built out, has bridges to other chains, and most importantly, a trust minimized peg to Bitcoin, um, and that um, transactions that occur on Sovereign are secured by Bitcoin miners and also expand and increase the security budget of those Bitcoin miners because they create an entirely new set of transaction fees that go to Bitcoin miners. But now, um, over the next few weeks, um, two teams that have been working together, uh, one team called the Mint team, which has been working on the Mint protocol, and one team called the Zero team, which has been working on the Zero protocol, both of which are sub-protocols of, uh, of uh, Sovereign are going to introduce uh, Bitcoin-backed stablecoins and a remarkable new type of product, the ability to take out loans against your Bitcoin at zero interest. So um, I think maybe a good place to start is why I think this is so exciting. Um, for a long time, I thought that if we could get truly decentralized stablecoins, then basically it's game over. One of the, um, you know, uh, Satoshi created Bitcoin with a goal of creating a peer-to-peer -peer currency. And a currency has several components. It has the store of value component so that you can make sure that you are not going to be inflated away. And that becomes more and more important with every passing day. But it also has the medium of exchange component, the ability to use uh, a currency to make payments for everyday things and um, the medium of exchange leads to the unit of account component in other words that people start pricing things in um, the currency and bitcoin exists in a world in which there are already fiat currencies that people use as their unit of account and their primary medium of exchange every single day and so the experience has been that you kind of need to get into Bitcoin. And in fact, even uh, more than that, people often price their Bitcoin holdings in dollars or their local currency. And so this has always been a point of centralization for Bitcoin. And it's always been something which has held Bitcoin back from the full potential of adoption for people to be able to save their money in a non-volatile way, to spend their money in a non-volatile way, and to price things in a non-volatile way in comparison to everything else that they're doing in their lives. So stable coins have become very, very popular for exactly this reason, because they provide you with a lot of the benefits of crypto. They can also interact with Bitcoin and other uh, crypto assets, um, but they have stability. They have a peg tied to the currencies that people are familiar with most obviously the dollar but none of the stable coins that we have today are reliable and decentralized there are pretty decentralized stable coins which are sort of like the algorithmic stable coins but they are very risky they're a game which you know they're basically a, a new kind of fiat right which they you know they they have these central banks which are smart contracts which issue tokens and, 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 and destroy tokens on an arbitrary basis in order to try and keep a peg. And then you have centralized stable coins like Tether and USDC um, and really like DAI, which uh, provide you with a higher degree of security sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, but they have very big risks, both regulatory risks and operator risks. And and they obviously have those risks because they're centralized. So what if we had a truly decentralized stablecoin and more than that, one which is backed by the most reliable asset in the space by Bitcoin? So I think that's always been the dream. And I think I think of it as game over because once you have that, people around the world can start to use that asset instead of other things. Always 
are able to convert in and out of Bitcoin. And so now suddenly become Bitcoin becomes useful in El Salvador, in you know, exchanges, but also anywhere for um, saving, for payments, for unit of account. And it basically takes our digital gold, our Bitcoin, and introduces to the world of digital gold what um, currencies have always done instead of people transacting in the store of value in gold, right, which you keep in, in a vault. Um, you transact in uh, a token, a piece of paper or a coin, which represents your claim on that gold. And that's exactly what a Bitcoin backed stable coin does for our digital gold. So um, what's cool about this is we already have Bitcoin backed stable coin. It's called Dollar and Chain. And um, it's, it's very cool, but it is limited because it requires a high degree of collateralization and it requires that you basically sell to the money on chain protocol your Bitcoin and then the money on chain protocol becomes the owner of the Bitcoin and it issues against that dollars. What we really want is we want to have many different ways that we could choose to get this Bitcoin back stable coin and many different ways to create stability so that under any circumstance, we can have a capital efficient way of creating Bitcoin back stable coins. And in fact, not just of the dollar, but of any peg that we want, including a non-fiat peg. And that's what Mint does. Mint is a system for aggregating these different methods. So dollar on chain, zero, and other methods that are being built out in the sovereign ecosystem can be aggregated into one super stable um, uh, Bitcoin back stable coin. Um, and that's why it's called the Mint. It's the sovereign Mint. It's you know, probably the most direct competitor to the Federal Reserve because it issues dollars. It does so independently. It does so without recourse to dollars that the Federal Reserve has created. Um, and so that means that each and every one of us can now participate in the act, not just of using dollars, but of minting dollars. And what Mint does is it opens the door for us to have many different ways of creating these dollars. And one exciting way that is coming out is zero and what zero does is zero provides a way for you to borrow against your bitcoin from yourself and because you're borrowing from yourself you're paying zero interest rate forever and what that means is that nobody not miners not savers not speculators nobody needs to sell their bitcoin ever again because if you want liquidity you can now get dollars uh, on the basis of your Bitcoin and you can keep that line of credit that is created for you forever, forever, Laura. And as Bitcoin keeps growing up forever, your line of credit keeps growing and growing and growing. And so you can continue to borrow from yourself as the value of your Bitcoin accrues more value forever. And this is something that potentially you can do and then your children can do and your grandchildren can do and they can be like this nest egg of Bitcoin that entire the generations can live off of. So how does that work? How can a zero interest loan exist? Right? Who are you borrowing from? Well, because Mint is its own bank, Mint issues exactly like a bank does. Every time a bank gives out a loan, it's not taking money from someone else. It's creating new money. Well, Mint, when it creates this loan for you um, by by interacting with the zero protocol, it creates new Bitcoin backed stable coins. It creates new dollars and it gives them to you on the basis of your own holdings. And so like rich people today, you know, Elon Musk doesn't sell his Tesla stock when he needs to, uh, uh, to buy something. What he does is he borrows against his Tesla stock and that Tesla stock continues to go up. And so just from the accrual of value in the Tesla stock, if he needs to, he needs to, he can pay back the loan. And so this opens that, it democratizes that for everyone to be able to do with their Bitcoin. But it's even better than that because Elon Musk has to pay interest rate and that's why he has to sell some of his stock periodically in order to pay down those loans. But with a 0% interest rate, um, that, that loan can basically be held forever. And so I think this is an extremely exciting thing, both because we're getting a truly decentralized, reliable stablecoin backed by Bitcoin, the world's first truly decentralized stablecoin, 
and one which will remain decentralized into the future because I think DAI for a while was decentralized, but that has been reduced. And then in addition to that, we're getting away for Bitcoiners to be able to unlock the value of their Bitcoin for their everyday expenses, for everything from doing groceries to buying a house and never have to sell Bitcoin again. So I'm, I'm extremely excited about what's happening. And I think this is like, it was this kind of thing that got me excited. The potential that these kind of things could be created was what got me excited about Sovereign. Um, and it's the kind of thing that I want to use. And uh, let's open it up to discussion and questions. All right. So uh, I'm going to follow based on the uh, who requested first. So first, we're going to have Jack. I'm going to put you up to speak right now. Go ahead, buddy. Yep. Loud and clear, Jack. Um, question, the loan value ratio of the disease. The I, I think I got the question. He's asking about the loan to value ratio or, the, or what can also be called the collateral required collateral ratio, right? Mm -hmm. So when you take out a loan, you need to make sure, right? The way, the way a Bitcoin backed stablecoin works is it needs to know that it's, that it's always backed by at least $1 worth of Bitcoin. Um, Jack, if you could mute yourself, please. So, uh, so, but Bitcoin is volatile in comparison to the dollar, and so its price could go up, its price could, could go down, and so you need it to be a little bit over collateralized. And the question of how over collateralized you need it to be is based on how efficient and effective the mechanism of allowing people to redeem their Bitcoin for a dollar at any time is. Zero is a very, very efficient system. And so, what it does is it allows for a collateralization ratio or an LTV, a loan to value ratio of 110%. In other words, to create $100 worth of Bitcoin, the lowest amount of Bitcoin you would need is $110 worth of Bitcoin. Now, having $110 worth of Bitcoin in the zero protocol, in other words, having the lowest possible collateralization ratio is also the riskiest possible collateralization ratio because if Bitcoin suddenly dips against the dollar, and your collateralization ratio drops below 110%, then your position can get liquidated. What does that mean? You're, you could end up with $105 worth of um, um, uh, stable coins. And um, the person who redeemed against you could end up with um, $105 worth of Bitcoin, right? So you would end up with a stable coin. So you wouldn't lose money but you would be taken out of your Bitcoin position. And then one question that people could ask is, what happens to the other $5? Well, that's the profit for the Zero Protocol. Right? So the Zero Protocol makes profit in two ways. One, from an origination fee. So on average, creating a, a loan like this, even though you pay zero interest, you pay a 0.5% um, origination fee. And then the second thing is, when there are these sort of redemption liquidations, 5% um, goes to the protocol and to the liquidators. Now, um, what's advisable, therefore, is that you, you, you know, you, you, if you're going to hold a low collateralization ratio, you should babysit your, your, your loan a little bit and make sure that you don't fall under. You also uh, need to take into account something else, which is that the system as a whole always make sure that it's going to have more than enough Bitcoin to pay everyone back. And so it requires that the system as a whole has 150% or $150 worth of Bitcoin for $100 in circulating supply and uh, of stablecoin. And so if it, the system as a whole drops below that, then again, you can start redeeming against the lowest collateralized positions. So if you want to take a very, very long-term position and you don't want to have to think about it or look at it at all, you want to do a 300% ratio. If you're um, going to take a shorter-term position, right, a shorter-term loan, you can have a lower collateralization ratio. And if you're going to look at, you know, babysit your, your loan very carefully and make sure you're always ready to add more funds or to reduce the size of the loan, then you can take as low as 110%. Um, uh, and that provides the user with a great deal of flexibility. 
And right now, I think the UI that's going to be launching is going to be quite janky. But the team is working on a UI that's going to make this very, very easy and intuitive for people to understand, you know, to have like super safe loan, super uh, risky loan and something in the middle. Uh, Jack, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, groundbreaking stuff. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Mishmash, you go next. Just unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your time, Yago. Um, I'm, um, I'm not an expert in this field, so um, forgive me for the um, simple questions. But is it correct that the security of funds when operating within the sovereign ecosystem is dependent on the robustness of um, RSK? The security of the funds... Um, well, sort of and, and anything that you do within the system, whether it's holding RBTC or sovereign um, and sort of generally having some of one's wealth locked up in, um, you know, various parts of the sovereign DeFi ecosystem. Um, yeah. is, is the security of your funds, um, you know, dependent on the security of RSK? Is that, is that fair? And, and, um, as a, sorry, as a first question. Yes. So I'll, first of all, it's definitely fair and it's definitely something everyone should be aware of, right? When you're using rootstock, when you're using sovereign, you're taking on a number of new types of risks, right? Now, I think these risks are definitely manageable and the system has proven to be secure in its operation up until now. But it's very important that anyone who's doing anything with their Bitcoin understand the risks that they're taking, right? So... When you're using the zero protocol, for example, here are some of the risks that you are taking on. One is the Bitcoin that is held is um, held as a peg Bitcoin, right? So the, all the Bitcoin that moves from main chain into rootstock, into sovereign, is pegged Bitcoin. And if something goes wrong with the peg, you could be locked out from your funds for a while or you could potentially lose access to that Bitcoin forever. Now, the system has been designed... Uh, to be extremely robust and to make sure that that never happens. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, there are um, no guarantees that that robustness is, is 100%. So, for example, yeah. Um, I, I'm sure it's like a reasonably um, complicated topic and therefore sort of can't be treated in uh, you know in, in completeness here but um uh is are there any documents or sources that you think are particularly good for people who want to read more about the sort of current arguments um uh, or critiques of of the the security and and maybe an, any uh recommendations for keeping up to date with sort of how that evolves if it does change over time yeah so i i would recommend uh, I mean, if you if you follow the Sovereign blog uh, or Sovereign Twitter, you, you'll see updates as that changes or improves in the future. But if you just um, if you just uh, Google rootstock uh, peg notories, um, uh, you, you you'll you'll find documentation which will be able to cover that for you. But just so you know, just on a very very high level, what uh, the rootstock peg does is it has a multi-sig system which um, has uh, multiple pegnatories. Uh, and what is a pegnatory? It's it's some um, party that are signers to the multi-sig but are also running software which independently from them, because it's using a hardware secured module, also signs the transactions. And then um, both they and the um, hardware secure module are um, receiving cryptographic proofs in the form of SPV proofs um, about the activity, in other words, the, the, the ability to transfer funds in and out of the peg. And so for something to go wrong, you'd need a majority of both the hardware secure modules and a majority of the peg network multi-sig system, which would receive the funds after a year of inactivity. So, Again, 
there's definitely a risk there. I would say it's probably the most secure multi-sig system anywhere in existence, but um, that's one risk that you're taking. The second risk that you're taking is that um, rootstock could potentially be 51% attacked, which could um, uh, revert transactions, right? Um, or slow down the chain. The third thing is that Zero itself is a smart contract system, and there may be a vulnerability in the Zero protocol. So I think those are the risks that you are taking when you're using these systems. And then there's a final risk, which is that you don't understand what you're doing. And you somehow you know lose your keys or something like that. Um, all of these risks, I think, are substantially lower than the risk that you would experience if you were using a centralized service of any kind, not just because it's not centralized, but also I think the technology is open, is more auditable, and is more secure. But it's also true that this is anything that you're doing like this is more insecure or more risky than just holding funds in a cold wallet. Thank you. That that's very helpful, and and um, and perhaps it falls into one of those aforementioned categories. But um, you know, it, um, if um, if you're successful with um, the use of this uh, sort of st- stable coin and um, various other um, elements of your DeFi ecosystem, uh, w- what is the robustness of of um, the sovereign? ecosystem to um, sort of a, st- a state level uh, interference or pressure to close down? Yeah, so I think uh, Sovereign is actually quite robust to a state level attack. Um, there's 13,000 people, uh, or at least 13,000 addresses that are participating in staking. Um, any changes to the protocol require a vote uh, and um, some degree of majority. Um, protocol changes that can actually um, shut down the system or uh, change access to user funds would require an 80% majority. Um, And so, you know, if the SEC were to come to me or to you and say, look, uh, what uh, Sovereign is doing is uh, should be regulated activity and we want you to start being regulated, then we... uh, would uh, have to invite them to write a SIP, a sovereign improvement proposal, and try to get it voted on by the community because there's no other way to make that change. Thanks. That's re- that's really helpful. All right. Well, we hope that covers it, Ms. Mesh. Uh, Thank you so you. much. You're welcome. Uh, our next speaker is Destinesia. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Welcome. Welcome, Eden. Uh, yeah, first, Eden, you and a big congrats to you and the team for all the exciting developments and amazing what uh, what you're all doing. Um, really, uh, really cool to see. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is on the duration of the loan. So am I correct in understanding there's no duration to the loan? There's no, there's no obligation to pay off a loan, say, after three years, ten years. It's it's It has an eternal maturity is is that correct or or how does it work that's correct that's correct you could uh, because you're not paying interest right so if you were paying interest over time it would be like your collateral was held in a leaky bucket and you would be sort of leaking bitcoin slowly over time but because there's zero interest of the loan you can hold that loan forever okay that's clear and um Pragmatically, because I'm in, the, I'm based in the eurozone in the here in the Netherlands. So how would I then spend that loan in, into the real economy here? Supposed to, to, uh, to, to say to fund part of a house, for instance, or 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 buy a car, or or uh, take on the, or pay the education for my children. How would that work? Well, that will change over time. In the first instance, um, the stablecoin will be added to. Babelfish. So Babelfish Protocol have said that they're going to add this as um, one of the stable coins in their aggregated basket, which means that you will at any time be able to convert these stable coins to USDC, to DAI, to Tether, to um, uh, Binance stable coins. Um, and then you can uh, withdraw them in the way that you would be able to withdraw any of those stable coins. 
what we would like to see grow around this and there's going to be efforts to to introduce is the ability for um companies to start plugging this in to retail payments to atms to debit cards so that you'd be able to actually just go you know with your apple pay and pay directly um you know at the cashier at the store basically using your line of credit ultimately where i think we would like to be is in a world where you have bitcoin you hold your bitcoin uh in the system and it stays bitcoin stays liquid bitcoin um until such time as you want to make some kind of purchase and at that point you'd basically um take a little bit more out of your line of credit right so you go down to the store and you buy a hundred dollars worth of groceries you would uh, decrease your line of credit by a hundred dollars and it would you just swipe through your card which would be attached to the system that does that automatically so that might take a few years but i think that's ultimately where we're going wow yeah that makes sense you thanks a lot and um uh well cannot wait actually for that to materialize maybe one one follow-up question i assume that um the collateral the btc collateral you will then put on the rootstock uh blockchain and once it serves as collateral it's in a way tied up so you cannot use it for other things right i mean that is that's that is how i should look that's at it correct. is that correct? right so so it's okay. like uh when when your your line of credit is backed by the bitcoin right so when um when you're using your bitcoin for the line of credit then obviously you can't use it for anything else otherwise we'd be double counting All right and we're not a centralized service so we don't do that <laughs> <laughs> no, no, exactly. No, clear. I, I, I get it. So, so if you want to then say make your Bitcoin free again, then you need to pay off your loan. Uh, that is ultimately the the trade off, I think. So, you you create you build up that line of credit versus your uh, locked up Bitcoin, which you can then spend into the real economy. But suppose you want to use Bitcoin for something uh, for different purpose, then you you pay off the loan. Well, there there are two options, right? So one is that you would just come and put more dollars, you know. You 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 know you want to buy a house. Um, you buy a house. You take out a mortgage after you've bought out the house on the basis of the of the house, right? And then you immediately pay back the loan. Your Bitcoin's free again, right? Um, so that could be like one way that you would do it. The other way is that you hold the position, right? And Bitcoin goes from fifty thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars, and then it goes to five hundred thousand dollars, and then it goes to a million dollars, right? At which point um, you say, "All right, well, my original loan, I had fifty thousand dollars of collateral. I now have a million dollars of collateral. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to um, basically convert that fifty thousand dollars and give up that, basically sell off that fifty thousand dollars to pay off my loan. So you could imagine that you create a loan today." And you hold that loan for, I don't know, let's call it five years. And then five years from now, Bitcoin's at a million dollars. So for 5% of the Bitcoin that you put in, you've now paid off your loan and the rest of your Bitcoin is is free and clear. Clear, Eden. Thanks a lot. And um, thanks very much for answering the questions. Wish, uh, wish you and the team all the luck and uh, keep on pushing. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Guys, just a reminder. Uh, if you still don't follow us on YouTube, Telegram, Facebook, or here on Twitter, uh, make sure to do that. Okay, subscribe on YouTube. Be the first to be updated on all the news from Sovereign. Uh, we will update regarding the start date for the zero presale very soon. So make sure that you're subscribed to all of our updates, and you'll get to know first. Now, next we have Techie World. Go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. How are you doing, Teki? I have two questions. One question is regarding uh, tokenomics and another question is regarding uh, partnerships. Uh, let's go with second question. Do you have any partnerships for with other protocols to integrate Zero? Because at max, Zero will be an RSK chain, right? Yes. So um, there aren't any um, partnerships announced and Sovereign, as you know, doesn't announce partnerships because Sovereign is a protocol and it doesn't 
really enter into partnerships in that way. What uh, what does happen is that other projects sort of announce partnerships or, pro- or or plans to use Sovereign, and we've seen this happen several times in the past. So, for example, uh, Transact, when they um, introduced the fiat on-ramp, um, there is... There are conversations that um, I've been told about, which are happening um, to introduce retail payments using um, these stable coins uh, that are minted by Mint. Um, And there are also um, uh, companies or projects that are talking about providing liquidity and providing on-ramps and off-ramps. So um, I expect that we'll hear... Um, you know, so those sort of partnerships uh, being announced um, over, you know, the coming months. And uh, regarding tokenomics, uh, uh, when I was reading the SIP, uh, I saw for Mint there was no wasting and uh, for Zero there was one month lockup. Uh, so how do you think uh, there would not be a dump? Did you get my question? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, so in SIP, uh, it was mentioned that Bootstrap event uh, sale, bought basic, basically pre-sale. There was no wasting, right? Yeah. Everything is free for Mint and for uh, uh, Zero, it was one month lockup or up to one month lockup. I didn't understand. Is it one month or up to one month? Like, what is the meaning of up to one month? I think the idea was that um, it, it, it may take... Um, a month or maybe I think the original thing was six weeks before the system launches and you're able to start trading and using you know, the zero tokens. So that was added to the SIP to let people know that that might be the case. Um, it might be shorter. Um, okay. You know, okay. Still- I, I get it that point. Due to some, let's say, technical work, it might take up to one month. Uh, let's put it it simple. So, is uh, so there there is a possibility of dump, right? Because it's fully unlocked. Uh, yes, I think um, I think that chances of like a dump in the way that you're describing it don't really exist in quite the same way with sub protocols because these are SOV bonded tokens, which means that they're basically backed by SOV. They're ba- they, in a way they're kind of like. Um, fractionally wrapped SOV. And so you can always convert them into SOV. Um, and th- when the protocol launches, the value of the SOV will still be there and and, 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 and there's you know, a small fee for converting it back to SOV. So it, you'd actually lose money sort of unnecessarily. Like that if, you've, if you've got hold of mint tokens or zero tokens, um, there's not a lot of um, benefit uh, to, to trying to immediately convert it back to SOV. Um, so I think that that would be unlikely. Um, but, you know, it's possible. People, you know, uh, it, it, you, the, the system is designed to allow people to do with their tokens as they choose. Um, That's because the, by default, SOV has fallen down from 20 to 19. Mostly the sale happened was around 20 to 25, you can guess. Average, right? Between 20 to 25. Again, if people, uh, like, it might have, it might take a snowball effect and people might sell because SOV sold, you know, cascading effect might happen. That was one thing I'm thinking about it. Right. Um, Well, it could happen. I'm not overly concerned about that. Um, In fact, it would almost be, you know, maybe... It, it, users have really very little to gain from that. Um, but, you know, it could happen. Yeah, thank you. All right, Sid, go ahead. Yep. Thanks, Yago, for your time. Uh, so my question is, what happens to the existing lending pools for uh, USDT? And I think there's a lending pool for XUSD as well, right? Uh, both of those have, uh, both of those require interest, etc. Uh, what happens to those lending pools? So those lending pools will continue to exist, and I think will continue to be useful. 
And the reason it'll continue to be useful is because they also allow you to borrow against other types of collateral. So, for example, um, you know, Ethereum can be added as collateral. Uh, uh, stable coins exist as collateral in that system. And so people can choose to borrow against other assets. It's also the case that there's different main mechanism there, right? So um, it's true that you pay interest, but um, you uh, can't be sort of redeemed against uh, unless uh, uh, you fall below the 150 uh, uh, percent collateralization, which is not the case with uh, zero and zero in the unlikely event. And this, I think, is an extremely unlikely event. But in the unlikely event that the entire system is under collateralized, even if your uh, uh, um, particular um, loan line of credit is um, collateralized above 150%, you could still have that redeemed into the stable coin. Um, so while it's an unlikely event, it's, it's a possible event. And so that's, that's a slightly different situation. Um, so I think what will happen in all likelihood is that some people will continue to use that lending facility because they're familiar with it, um, even for Bitcoin. They'll certainly continue to use it for other collateral. Um, and probably over time, uh, or maybe even immediately, it might happen quickly, but we, we'll, we'll probably see that Bitcoin um, lending is going to happen more and more through zero. Thanks, Yago. All right, Scarcity Miner. Go ahead, buddy. Oh, uh, yes, thank you for your time. Um, I was just wondering, so, like, how we can interact with the sovereign platform and how, you know, we can easily... Uh, deposit Bitcoin and this turns into smart Bitcoin RBTC. Will there come a time in the near future where we could easily transfer that RBTC back to on chain Bitcoin, like either through the R wallet or using the sovereign platform? Yeah. So, one of the reasons that the system is still considered to be an alpha is because that's still quite a headache. It's, it's complicated and and, and, and annoying to do right now. But a system to allow for um, fast um, peg out as well as fast peg in has already been developed and has been audited. And um, so it's getting quite near to deployment. And I think that it's likely that it'll be deployed before the end year is out. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I'm loving the platform so far, so thank you for uh, answering that for me. Right. I think when that happens, probably that will be a um, point where we can choose to declare that Sovereign is out of alpha. Okay. Um, that will be like a big, big event for us. We should have a party. <laughs> yeah, we should have a big, big DeFi Bitcoin party. All right, great. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And again, I love Sovereign, so thank you. Well, I, thank, thanks very much, and I love seeing you. I've seen you in a number of rooms. It's, it's cool. Thanks. Yeah, again, thank you very much for everyone here who's participating, asking questions, listening. Uh, we're very glad to have you with us, supporting the Sovereign Project. Uh, now we're going to have Moonkin next up. Hello, guys. You hear me all right? Yep. How you doing, Moonkin? Yeah, I'm good. Good. Nice to see you guys again. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, happy to hear about the, the peg out feature. Um, just to be you know clear there you're implementing the peg out feature from from sovereign it's not like you know it's being facilitated by the rsk um team and then you know at some point it's going to be integrated in sovereign or it's actually you know being developed within sovereign so that that feature will be available for us as soon as possible is that correct right so so like fast btc um it was developed entirely by um sovereign core Mm -hmm. uh, and so fast BTC, um, bi-directional fast BTC has also been developed entirely by Sovereign Core. Um, and although there is ongoing work between Sovereign Core and the RSK team around uh, various improvements to um, the um, the PEG, um, but uh, but yeah, this is um, 
you know, has been developed by, by Seven Core. And, and one of the cool things that we're seeing is, you know, more and more protocols like Tropicos and Money on Chain um, on the Rootstock network have integrated directly with FOSS BTC as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Happy to hear. Um, so I have a few questions. Maybe I'm just going to, like, <laughs> you know, spray and pray them, and uh, you can sort of answer um, as best as you can. But I have a question on, like, if you could talk a little bit on, like, the you know, short summary, interplay between Mint and, and Fish. And then I'd also like to know, like, um, who's who's deploying Zero, and, you know, since it's a fork of liquidity or... Are they cooperating or talking to the liquidity team? And um, like, what are the long-term plans for zero USD on RSK and uh, eventually perhaps on other chains? Um, any thoughts on adding liquidity USD to Sovereign? And finally, thoughts on Blockstream and the liquid network? <laughs> Sorry if that's a yeah, that, that is a lot of. Yeah. Like, we should just have, we should have a space is just with you. Man. Yeah, next time, <laughs> next time. <laughs> so um, I'll try and uh, answer as many of those as I can remember. Yeah. So okay. So the next zero, the next team call. Have, zero team have been talking to the liquidity team, and I believe they are planning to um, airdrop some zero tokens to liquidity holders. Um, their interplay between Mint and uh, Babelfish or yep. the XUSD aggregator. So um, the XUSD aggregator and Babelfish um, are uh, working to create an insured pool of a whole set of different stable coins. Um, Mint has a much more narrow focus. Um, it is and plans to always be purely Bitcoin backed. And so the idea is that um, you, as the user, should understand um, the difference between these two and recognize the different risk profile and collateral profile of both of these systems. And um, Babelfish with XUSD has already helped substantially reduce the potential for systemic risk from one stablecoin like Tether or USDC in the sovereign system. But I'm hoping that we'll see more and more users and I'd encourage all of you, you know, to take some Bitcoin, convert it into um, the the mint uh, 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 stablecoin, um, whose name um, I think we've kind of already revealed, um, but uh, I've been told not to <laughs> talk about it. But you know, into the new stablecoin, and and uh, you know, pair that against Bitcoin in a liquidity pool, and and start using that with the goal that we can get the pool of liquidity for um, uh, the Bitcoin backed stablecoin to be at least as deep as the XUSD stablecoin because that will help make, you know, Sovereign a truly unique platform focused on Bitcoin, but also to be uniquely resilient um, because it will have, you know, at its core, a decentralized Bitcoin backed stablecoin. So I think there's something that we as community members can do just as, you know, pioneers in the space to help deepen that liquidity, make it available and encourage traders to come and trade against that uh, and and really give birth to that ecosystem. Um, With regards to, um, uh, I think the the last piece of your question was, uh, oh, yeah, so um, do we expect to have liquidity uh, in Sovereign? So they have a token called LUSD. I think LUSD might be added at some point to the Babelfish basket, but that would be very much up to the Babelfish community. And certainly, you know, they're a very open community, so you can propose it to them. I think what we would like to see is uh, the new stable, new Bitcoin back stable coin um, begin to be used across multiple different chains. And so, you know, we've got a number of bridges that have been developed, more bridges will be deployed. And I think this, you know, we should all also be encouraging the use of this as, you know, a, a significant uh, stable coin across the DeFi ecosystem and across all chains. Mm-hmm. And then finally, with regards to Blockstream, so Blockstream had a very cool announcement um, today, I think it was today, or maybe it was yesterday, about um, issuing a bond mm-hmm. uh, with El Salvador. I think that's really cool. I think, um, I think you know, we'd like to, and we're, you know, Sovereign is doing some things and there's a team working with El Salvador in 
uh, around integrating sovereign, and I suspect we'll start to see more announcements around that over time. Um, beyond that, um, you know, sovereign is a very different project from um, from liquid, the the liquid side chain, and I think sovereign and the um, the rootstock sidechain have very significant advantages. Um, they are more permissionless. Um, Bitcoin backed, uh, so they're backed and secured by Bitcoin proof of work. They pay transaction fees directly to Bitcoin miners. There is a trust minimized peg. Um, these are all, and and it's Turing complete. These are all very very significant advantages. And so, you know, when one of the reasons I became excited about sovereign. Um, and one of the reasons that I think Sovereign is likely and has already been growing faster than these other protocols um, is because it has the set of advantages. And despite the fact that it's you know the youngest and sort of at the moment the least funded of these different um, efforts, it's it's growing very very robustly and and quicker and has more actual activity. So I think um, I think Sovereign is is currently the dark horse and is underestimated, um, but I think that is rapidly changing. Wow, you actually managed to rem- remember every single question. <laughs> I'm impressed. Okay, yeah, thank you ever, uh, ever so much for uh, for your time. I will sit back and uh, enjoy the rest of the show. Sure thing, Munken. Thanks, Munken. Yeah, hey, hi, Yago. Hi, Shoya. Uh, uh, no problem. Yeah. Cool. So- Sorry to stop you, but you have kind of a line here. Uh, I think Pipo was next. Pipo Laporto? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, uh, can you hear me well? We can. Yes. Okay. So, quick question. Um, if uh, you borrow uh, on the Zero protocol, and initially, for example, you put in 150% LTV, and the value of uh, Bitcoin um, increases so much that you end up sitting on 300% LTV. Can you um, uh, uncollateralize 150% of that LTV? Yes. Okay, nice and simple answer then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So basically, if you end up over collateralized, you, you, can, you can free some of the Bitcoin that's kept in collateral for other uses. Yes, that's exactly right. Very good. It, it would be all in the GUI. And, and that's what I mean when I say you can either just see your line of credit expand and increase over time, or you can, you know, choose to even close out your position as Bitcoin rises. You could close out the position and end up having only a small fraction of that Bitcoin used to pay off the loan and the rest of your Bitcoin is free. Perfect. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. All right. Thanks, people. Bitcoin King. Go ahead. Go, Paul, you go next after him. Hey, uh, I just wanted to say um, this is an amazing idea um, platform that you have set up here. Um, I can't believe this is actually happening with a 0% interest on uh, your own Bitcoin. I think it's genius. Um, my only question is, is there a top-up program if Bitcoin does go down in a um, correction, would you be able to top up more Bitcoin so you don't get liquidated? Yes. So that's currently manual, but you can definitely, in fact, the whole system is reliant on the idea that users should be able to do that. So that's definitely possible. One thing which the Zero team have discussed working on is helping to automate that system. And um, that's, a, that's a more complicated thing. And if they manage to do that, which I think they will, uh, it also opens up a really interesting new product for Zero, which is that you can um, earn yield, dollar-denominated yield on your Bitcoin. The way that would work is you would basically put Bitcoin in and the system would generate dollars and start lending them out. And then as the value of Bitcoin rose, it would automatically uh, mint more Bitcoin, more dollars and start lending those out. Wow. So you would be earning interest. Oh and it can, even, it can even go a step further than that. And it can um, use what it, the, 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 the interest that it earns over that to just buy more Bitcoin. And so you could basically go and use this as a way to just sort of passively stack you would have like an infinity loan that could constantly keep printing you more. And wow, that's 
That's amazing. I don't think people really understand how huge this is. This is, this is awesome. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Okay, go back. That's your time, buddy. Go ahead. Hey, hi, Yago. Hi, Shaolin. How are you guys? Very good. Thank you very much. How are you? Yeah, hi. Yeah, Raylene, I'm seeing you too. Good to see you over here. Yep. Uh, my for, I have some quick question, but I would like to start with the first that what is the core need of building a DEF on a Bitcoin? Like, I would like to understand it, understand it from a DEF. So, sure. I think um, there's, you know, so I think what attracts people to Bitcoin is it's something that you can truly own, it's something that you don't need a middleman. Uh, in order to interact with. It's something which is decentralized and secure. The problem with Bitcoin uh, is that all of those things are true, but if you actually want to use your Bitcoin or put your Bitcoin to use, if you want to trade with it, if you want to earn yield on it, if you want to in you know use it for a bet or for a futures market or you know hedge against it, anything you want to do with your Bitcoin, even something as simple as payments, right? Or creating a Bitcoin backed stablecoin. Um, requires that today, if you're not using Sovereign, you're using some kind of centralized intermediary. And then basically the magical properties of Bitcoin are gone. And then you kind of wonder like, well, actually, did all of this make sense, right? But with Sovereign, Bitcoin gets more superpowers, right? With Bitcoin DeFi, Bitcoin gets the superpower of you able to not only have your Bitcoin, but to use your Bitcoin without middlemen um, and with your control. And that's um, the power of DeFi for Bitcoin. It's the power of smart contracts for Bitcoin, and it's the mission of Sovereign. Cool. So uh, I guess it's uh, available with Taproot, right? But uh, this particular protocol is on proof of transfer, Yago? No. So proof of transfer is a um, method that is used by the Stacks uh, chain. Yeah. And um, what Stacks does is Stacks has a separate cryptocurrency called um, uh, STX, and you stake STX, and then um, people can um, sort of like uh, validators can prove that they have moved Bitcoin um, to show that they have sort of anchored the Stacks chain to Bitcoin. And then they move that Bitcoin to wallets that are associated with SDX uh, stakers. Okay, so that's a very different model from what Sovereign does uh, and what Sovereign does with Rootstock, which is that with um, Rootstock, uh, what is happening is that the Bitcoin miners are mining um, the sidechain. They're directly mining the sidechain, and um, the fees are actually paid in Bitcoin rather than you know some other token to the Bitcoin miners. So the Bitcoin miners earn more Bitcoin for performing this additional mining work. So it's a very, very different model. Um, I think both of these models have their merits. I personally prefer uh, the, the merged mine model because I think it's more pure, more secure, and more Bitcoin native. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah. The one last question is, as you said that if you want to transact or if you want to do any communication with or through our Bitcoin, then only we will need a DAF on it, right? Unless then we will not ever need it. So uh, is there any real use case for users right now? Is there any huge volume where users should focus or get on a DeFi? Or there is a still a time or we will see a market after four or five years for that? So um, I think there's a huge market for it. And I think the proof of that is that Sovereign's really only been live for a few months. It started being live in April. Uh, we've seen seen over a billion dollars in just in trades, not even including loans that have occurred in the Sovereign platform. Um, there's more than $165 million actively managed uh, in the Sovereign platform by users. Um, so... There seems to be strong interest and strong demand, but I think we're really, really at the very, very beginning. Um, and um, what I think can happen here um, is that this becomes the primary way that people use Bitcoin because 
why not? Uh, why would you want to go through a centralized intermediary? Um, and and it, I think it also changes the way people think about the crypto space in general because instead of having to launch a new chain for every type of functionality that you have, you can introduce that functionality through um, a Bitcoin um, sidechain or even a, uh, a zero-knowledge roll-up to Sovereign. So um, we might uh, see... Um, a migration of a lot of the uh, things that are being developed today and in the future um, back to the Bitcoin system because Bitcoin has the deepest liquidity, the largest user base, and is the most secure system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. Thank you. I got on that point. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you have pretty much answered everything. The one last thing is uh, all the best to you guys. You are developing something cool with the Solarian. Uh, may you provide a security around the transactions, but uh, as I said, it will take a uh, five years to get a real use case behind it, uh, to trade it right now for the, you know, for a shit coin or so to trade or use a Bitcoin for any other stuff is pretty much a, uh, is there any other product rather than a sovereign which has already built on the root type path and uh, with the root they have proven the AML or the TVL with it? Yeah, so... Um... So, first of all, Zero and Mint are sub-protocols of Sovereign. Um, beyond that, you've got Money on Chain, you've got Tropicus, you've got um, several NFT projects, you've got uh, some gaming projects. But I think, really, we're, you know, um, this was, Rootstock was a technology which um, needed some additional refinement. And what's really been cool about what the Sovereign um, core team have done is they've introduced those refinements and improvements to Rootstock uh, built out a lot of infrastructure, which have made it useful. And now we're starting to see, um, you know, a, a migration of talent, devs, and 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 and, and projects to the uh, to the protocol. Okay, Ago, thank you. Can I have any technical document on a zero or mint? Can you share um, it? Or is it in website? I, I don't. I don't know how to. Sh- I've I've been trying to figure out how to share on Spaces. I don't know yeah, how to do it. Uh, just go to when it beat. Or uh, press a share button, you will find the space above it. Where where do I do that? Sorry, on n. When you will go to any tweet, or just press uh, share button. Ah, uh, so I need to go to the tweet. Yep. Um. All right. Uh, I still don't get it. Oh, okay. I see. So I I navigate to. All right. Cool. Yeah. Um. Uh, I I don't. Um, no, if I have an, a, a tweet that is sort of applicable right now, but um, if you go to the Sovereign Wiki, you can start finding that information. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Okay, guys, I see we have a few people asking to come back to the stage. I just want everyone to be able to ask their questions first, and then if we still have time, and Yago can uh, still be here with us then I'll get you on the stage uh, again. Uh, so don't go anywhere. <clears throat> okay, next up we have Cryptasm. Hi guys, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, it's... Hey. Yeah, yeah, hi. It's Cryptasm, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have a quick couple of questions. So the first question is, so like... Uh, so, like uh, through this uh, zero protocol and mint protocol, the people will be able to, you know, uh, borrow money uh, by collateralizing their Bitcoin. So, right now we are having uh, this current lending pools of RBTC and uh, other XUSD and RUSDT. So, whether uh, they will be kept or they will be done away with once the zero protocol uh, will get implemented. Yeah, sure. So I actually answered this question previously a little bit earlier. Uh, Those um, lending pools will remain uh, and I think will continue to be useful, mostly for other forms of collateral, but also because people are familiar with them and they're slightly different. So people will um, very possibly continue to want to use them. Okay, okay. So uh, like someone uh, wants to uh, like hodl BTC for two, three years. And so like uh, while hodling, they want to earn, you know, some kind of percentage of APY, like uh, currently the lending pool is offering around 2.77, 2.78% APY. So it will be still possible to deposit the BTC in lending contract and uh, continue to hodl BTC. 
Yes, of course, because that's a totally <clears throat> that's a totally different thing, right? That's borrowing okay. Bitcoin instead of borrowing dollars. Got it. Um, got it. Yeah. So definitely. Got it. Uh, so, like, what I understand is Bitcoin, uh, the the blockchain of Bitcoin and RS key is very secure. But uh, what I understand is by uh, giving access, uh, so like by lending your Bitcoin on sovereign debt, you are basically in, uh, interacting with a smart contract. So if there is uh, some kind of vulnerability in smart contract, so there might be a possibility of uh, liquidity, uh, like a liquidity has been drawn out or like DeFi attacks, which, are, which have become a recent thing on Ethereum chain. So is it possible, uh, this kind of security bugs or risks that uh, we will have if we deposit our BT, uh, BTC into the lending pool? Yes, it is possible. Um, that said, okay. um, the likelihood, I think, is low. Um, we say this because one of the things that Sovereign tries to do is learn from the entire ecosystem. And so, for example, the Zero system is... Um, um, uses a lot of the, is, it, you know, is, 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 is basically based off of a different system which already has existed for a while on the Ethereum network called Liquity. Liquity has behaved very much as planned. We've also, you know, the Zero team have done additional work to improve the system and have um, Austin had the system audited by uh, uh, a bunch of different um, third parties, including devs from Sovereign Core. So I think, um, you know, again, th there is no guarantee ever of 100%. But to the extent that it's possible uh, to try and ensure and make sure that uh, these systems are going to be secure and will behave as expected, I think that work has been done. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Yago. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Cripsam. Uh, yep. Next up, we have Wikisha. Hi, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Loud yes. Loud. Okay. First of all, I congratulate uh, Sovereign Team and Yago uh, for being a part of a, such a great uh, project. I have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe you have answered it before, but I didn't able to get that. My my first question is basically when you are lending uh, uh, the zero stable coin instead of uh, uh, BDC and you are keeping the BDC and if there is a mass lending uh, of the people like uh, they the people are taking too much uh, stable coins uh, and keeping the BDC and in, at the same time the BDC price gets very low. Uh, in the recent uh, past weeks or months, you have already seen how uh, uh, volatile is the market uh, regarding the BTC. So in that case, what will happen? Uh, the whole thing will crash or comes down or people will be in loss. I didn't get this point. I, I'm still thinking about it. Can you please clear this point? Sure. So the system maintains a minimum um, of 150% collateralization. But in practice, we'll probably have much higher average collateralization. So let's say it will have 200% collateralization. That would mean that even if Bitcoin dropped, um, you know, 50% in an instant, the system would still have enough collateral to cover all of the issued loans. But usually... Right, and by usually I mean every single, or always up until now, including when Bitcoin has been most volatile, it hasn't instantly crashed fifty percent. Rather, what happens is the price starts to drop. So, for example, in March, April, we saw a price rise, and then we saw the price drop, you know, from sixty something thousand to thirty two thousand. So that was a fifty percent drop, but it took time. And so what would happen is that um, people's positions, you know, their Bitcoin collateral, its value would go down in comparison to the dollar. And so they would start to add more Bitcoin or start to reduce their exposure by closing out their loans because nobody wants to lose their Bitcoin. And so in practice, the system would be able to adjust um, more gradually. But 
the way the system has been designed is even if it couldn't adjust gradually, it would still be safe. And certainly with a gradual adjustment, it should remain very, very safe. But if if, if uh, mass majority of the people take a stable coin and doesn't come back? Yeah, so then they would lose their Bitcoin. They will lose your, their Bitcoin, but they will take the money 100% of the Bitcoin when the Bitcoin was on 60 and uh, now the Bitcoin is on 30. They are in the profit. No. Um, so think about it this way. Uh, what you care about, right, is only two things. One, you care if you're a lender, you care about keeping your Bitcoin. And if you're the holder of these dollars, these, these stable coins, all you care about is maintaining the value of a dollar. So let's talk about you as holding a dollar, right? Um, what you care about is that you can come to the protocol at any time and say, look, I have a dollar, give me a dollar worth of Bitcoin. And that will always be true under the scenario that I described, right? On the other hand, if the lender uh, allows the value of the Bitcoin that is collateralizing them to become too low, then people will come and say, give me you know, a dollar worth of Bitcoin. And that Bitcoin that the people who do that receive will be the lenders of Bitcoin. And so they will be out of Bitcoin. And in fact, they would be, you know, losing a little bit of money. Yeah, ultimately, if uh, there is a future away ahead as we are currently in now. So as far as I, I understand that the future is crypto, so obviously everything will go uh, in positive direction and will go up, hopefully. And your project is definitely one of them. And uh, uh, my last question is basically regarding uh, the zero. So I'm going to... Uh, invest heavily in zero uh, uh, tomorrow or day after tomorrow on Tuesday. Maybe you are starting pre-sale, right? Well, I heard that the sale may may, may be delayed. I'm not entirely sure to when, uh, but I was. I think the zero team asked to postpone it a little bit, maybe by a week. Um, but please go on. Yeah, it doesn't matter. If it's a week or two. I will. I will invest. And uh, what will be the benefit? for me to heavily invest in it and uh, at the time of uh, need that uh, as an investor i also want to take out some of my uh, investment and use in in the real world so what 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 is the minimum time duration that you think that uh, the investors of mint and zero can uh, well, basically help out um let, let me answer the question that i heard you ask so I think Zero has um, the potential to be an extremely profitable protocol. Uh, one thing that you can look at is the is the, the, the how profitable liquidity has been, um, and the way that Zero makes money is through origination fees and through liquidation fees, and both of those can be profitable. The liquidation fees, in particular, can be very very profitable. So. Where does that profit go? That profit goes to the stakers of Zero Token. And so if you want to make money, if you want to make Bitcoin, you stake Zero Token and you'll be earning Bitcoin. Um, so that's one way that you can sort of see the real. Sorry, I couldn't hear the last sentences you have said, but I did understand uh, the thing, the whole scenario. And uh, thank you very much for uh, for the answers in detail. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Okay, I think Iago is having a bit of a mic problem. Maybe connection. We'll wait a bit for him to uh, get this all set up. Uh, in the meanwhile, guys, if you still haven't subscribed to our YouTube, Twitter, Telegram, Discord, we're pretty much everywhere. We want you to help us spread the sovereign word. So... Go ahead, subscribe, send it to your friends, let them know about upcoming pre-sale. Uh, like Yago just mentioned, the, Sar the Zero team has asked for a postponement of the uh, sale. We will have the final date announced, hopefully uh, tomorrow, maybe the day after. Uh, but we're aiming to, uh, to spread this as soon as possible, of course. Let's see what's going on with Yago. Okay. Hi guys. Um, good day. 
Hi, Pisa. Yeah, uh, yeah, just a second. Let me get Tiago back here. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, but PCJ, we uh, have this line here. We have team now. Afterwards, it's Israel, then uh, you go. Okay? Okay. All right, so Tim, uh, go ahead. Tiago? Yeah. I don't know if you guys managed to hear the answer I gave to the previous question. Just the last two sentences slipped out, so maybe... Ah, okay. Because those last two sentences, they were gold. <laughs> Go ahead, give us this gold, and then, Tim, you can... No, 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 there was only, I don't even... <laughs> it was a one-time opportunity. I'll never manage to do it again. All right. Cool. Let's, 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 let's move on. Okay. Thanks for the information, guys. Uh, my question is, I, I live in the UK, and I'm just wondering how applicable a zero loan is for me. I, I don't know whether you know or not, but the UK tax authorities uh, state that crypto loans... Uh, taken out against loan taken out against crypto, uh, subject to capital gains tax at the time of taking them out. And I'm just wondering, has this been taken into account? And how, how would this happen if I take a loan out with uh, zero? How is this taken into account? Um, so sovereign protocol is completely, uh, uh, you know, agnostic to the regulations in various jurisdictions. And so this hasn't been taken into account by zero. What, it, it's, what, not a pri it's not a private transaction either, so it's, it needs to be accounted for uh, by me. Right, exactly. So the person that needs to take this into account is you, and you need to decide how you want to manage that. So I, I'm actually unfamiliar with that piece of regulatory... I don't know when it was introduced. Well, the only, the only way I know about it is that uh, I know that in the Celsius company, um, when people are taking a loan out with Celsius, it, in effect, they, what, what the UK tax authorities have, have said they must do is that they buy, they buy the Bitcoin off the user at the time of taking the loan out. And at the end of the loan, they, they sell the Bitcoin back to the user at the same price. And so, so the capital gains tax is at the point of uh, the, the tax transaction is at the point of launching the loan. I see. Well, this probably wouldn't be applicable to zero. Although, of course, this is not legal uh, advice. You'd need to talk to your own accountant. But the reason it isn't applicable to zero is because you're not actually selling your Bitcoin. Um, you're 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 bonding it in a smart contract, but it remains yours, and if, and you're the uh, you know the uh, the only person who can who yeah. there's no there's no custodian. So I don't actually think this would fall under that regulation. But of course, this is something that you need to check. I, uh, yeah, I, I just if I can just add to that is that of course Celsius um, don't want to uh, get involved in buying and selling uh, Bitcoin or anything, but. In order to do the transaction with UK people, they had to follow, it was insisted upon by the UK tax authorities that they put something in place that in effect said they'd, they'd uh, entered a contract to buy Bitcoin and to sell it back to you at the same price. So the, so the UK tax authorities impose that in order to do business. And I'm just wondering whether that's going to be the same case with zero. Um, the US tax authorities have no... Um, UK, UK. Sorry, I mean, uh, sorry, the UK tax authority, the FCA has no jurisdiction over sovereign. Sovereign is a sovereign jurisdiction. Um, and so, um, you know, they can put to forward a SIP requesting a change, but the community would yeah. need to accept that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jago. Sure. All right, next up we have Israel Obinia. Hey, thanks, um, thanks, guys. Thanks, Yoga, for all the information you provided so far. Um, I think you may have touched on this, but just a question about um, yield. Um, th there's a protocol, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, called Alchemix, which effectively provides a self-repaying loan. Um, but they, 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 they hand over, effectively, the collateral to Curve and to Yearn Finance to generate the yield. Do you have any plan within the context of sovereign to add yield to the um, the collateral, the underlying collateral, so that it will self-pay the loan rather than 
wait for an appreciation in the price of Bitcoin? Um, so at this point in time, I don't think that that is the plan. Um, the reason being that if you do that, um, you are introducing an additional risk vector. Now, um, Sovereign actually has fairly decent um, uh, interest that can be earned in Bitcoin. And it's possible that um, at, at some later stage, it would be possible to have um, zero, um, take the collateral and start lending it out. But that would um, imply a risk. And, the, and I think it's, it's a very significant risk, uh, at least conceptually. And, and we should be clear on what that risk would be. When you are borrowing, but when you are when you are lending out your Bitcoin, um, you are lending it out in such a way that it is collateralized, right? So the the borrower is over collateralized, but they're over collateralized with other assets. And so, in a worst case scenario, if the um, lender is unable to pay back, they have their assets collateralized, and you end up with the the same value, but in a totally different set of assets. It could be stable coins, it could be ETH, it could be whatever. Um, if zero wants to be able to say it is always fully backed by Bitcoin, by lending the Bitcoin out, there is this scenario in which it actually ends up being collateralized by some other asset, at least momentarily. And so a decision needs to be made by the zero community. And this is a discussion which they can have, you know, the zero token holders and SOV token holders can, can discuss whether or not that's a risk. Um, that uh, is, is is worth introducing. My personal view is, at least now, when we're introducing this this Bitcoin backed stablecoin, it is a unique asset in the entire crypto space. It is, you know, it's 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 a pure play uh, a stable coin which is decentralized and collateralized by this pristine asset. A very very clear sort of, you know, Bitcoin backed thing. Um, and I don't know if it would make sense for the additional small yield or, you know, two or three percent that it's possible to earn um, to, to to change that. One thing that I did mention earlier, however, is that you could have a system where um, you actually could do something with Alchemix where you put your Bitcoin in and that Bitcoin gets converted into stable coins, which are then lent out and then earn a yield. And then that could pay itself off. I sp per, sp personally, I think Alchemix is a little bit of a. It's a, it's a you know, there's quite a lot of. It's a bit of a game. It's you know, it's a, it, there's there's a lot of engineering, you know, financial engineering going into that. And so I think a lot of the users are not aware of all of the risks that are involved in Alchemix, um, which is that their collateral could get stuck basically forever. If you know, if the yield and curve, or the yield and um, year and goes down, which it is, it's currently going down. Um, it could be that your loan never pays itself off. And then, no, I, I totally agree with you. I'm, I'm not advocating that the same system is used, more the concept of self repayment. Right. right. Um, that's the only element, really, that is probably the question I'm putting forward. So, but no, I think, it, I think, I think based upon what you said originally around utilizing potentially the stable coin as a way to generate interest, which in turn you could then either buy more Bitcoin to reduce your collateral exposure or to pay off your loan, then I think, you know, in the future, you know, if that's something that comes online, then that, that, that would be really useful, I think. I agree. And so did the guides working on zero. And I know that they're working on this at least conceptually at this point. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, thanks. Who's next? Hey, Yago. Hey. Um, so I was uh, wondering if there would ever be like non-mark-to-market loans. Um, so just pay it back within like a, a time frame versus um, 
you know, uh, if, if it dips to a certain point, then you're kind of like instantly liquidated. That's definitely possible, but it would imply a totally different system. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, so, so what you can do is you can create like time-based loans. Um, but, but people need to be aware some, you know, uh, even small changes to the way financial systems are built can really change the types of risks and the types of yields and the types of things that are possible. And so um, it's important, you know, that people uh, as much as possible understand the differences between things. So um, one of the interesting things about uh, the way that uh, sovereign's current lending system works is it's basically fixed rates uh, on 28-day rolling windows. Um, uh, another aspect of it is that um, there are multiple different oracles that need to concur that the price has dropped below a certain uh, point, which would allow for margin calls. Now, it's possible to build out a system which would have, you know, different windows, like 60-day windows, and which would say that um, so long as you're servicing your loan, you don't get liquidated within that 60-day window. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that over time more developers and more people who are working in the sovereign ecosystem start building these out because even though they have subtle differences, they are useful to different people for different use cases. Um, but I don't think that's going to be something that's appropriate for zero. Okay, crypto hijack, go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, hi, Iago. I just uh, noticed the newly pinned uh, tweet, so my, my question is actually, actually a bit redundant. But first, let me congratulate you and the whole team for the tremendous work done with Sovereign. As an IT professional, I am more than impressed by the execution and the pace uh, behind the project. So uh, I was wondering... What was your opinion, matter of fact, in regard to the likelihood or even the technical feasibility of a country adopting Mint to empower the currency and actually implementing the Bitcoin standard, matter of fact, which now I see was tweeted. So I was actually thinking, reverting my question to what do you think will be the challenges for that to happen, the difficulties? Well, I can tell you that the Zero team, they're pseudonymous, but at least part of the team are from Latin America. And I know they're excited about being able to harmonize between the two legal tenders of um, El Salvador, the dollar and Bitcoin, and basically create a unified dollar Bitcoin legal tender. Um, and um, yeah, so the Zero team is pseudonymous, but some other people uh, on the Zero team uh, are from Latin America, as I understand it. And part of their inspiration for doing this is that they wanted to harmonize between the two legal tenders of El Salvador, the dollar and Bitcoin, and basically create a Bitcoin dollar. And um, the steps towards making that happen, well, first is, you know, launching Mint and launching Zero, But second, you know, integrating it into things like the Chivo wallet, retail payments, allowing people to start making um, and borrowing loans. Um, so, um, you know, uh, building the technology is one piece. And then the next piece is uh, uh, distributing it and making it easy uh, for people to use it by integrating it into the things that they're already using. And so those will be the, the, the coming steps. <clears throat> That's pretty amazing. Uh, to my understanding, tell me if I got it right. I personally see zero like the end game for the Bitcoin holder and mean as the end game for countries um, or sovereign organizations have proclaimed, even some programming organization that might want to act as a country. I remember, um, your space about the possibility analyzing all the legal aspects or creating basically a digital country, a borderless country. I see Mint as an incredible piece in this part, in this project. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's sort of like where I started the spaces was saying, I think this is game over ultimately, right? Because now we have totally sovereign financial system, which is able to not only have sovereign reserve currency, but sovereign, you know, exchange currencies, uh, you know, the kind of currencies that people use for day-to-day -day, 
payments and activities. And that means that once you're on-ramped into the system, you never need to off-ramp. And it means that once you hold Bitcoin, you never need to sell Bitcoin. You can always just um, lend against your Bitcoin. And it becomes, as a result, a truly powerful asset. Um, so, yeah, I think this is, I think this is really huge. I'm extremely excited about it. And, um, and I think, you know, yeah. I'm hoping we together as a community, let everyone know that this is happening, why this is valuable, why this is important and, uh, and get everyone involved. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Crypto Hijack. Okay, Trading Virus, you went off. Now you're here. Go ahead, buddy. Ask your question. Trading Virus, unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me now? So first of all, con congratulations on both uh, uh, the new tokens, Mint and Zero. I, I just uh, have a question to Iago that uh, out, of the, out of these two, which one do you like the most? Um, you know, you know, you don't ask someone to choose between their children, right? Or if you, if they're in a polygamous relationship, you don't ask them, which is their favorite wife. I know, but I, you know, I mean, it's, they, they work very well together, right? They're, they're complementary. I like the fact that Mint gives us the ability to use Bitcoin with a stable coin, which is truly decentralized and means that. Um, we can now use Bitcoin for everyday payments. And I like the fact that zero means that we never have to sell any Bitcoin ever again. So between those two things, I mean, they're awesome. It's like, uh, it's like dating twins. It's kind of like every man's dream. <laughs> Your answer actually resonated me because before before asking this question, I, I thought that uh, it is it is something that I, I'm asking a father that out of their children, which one uh, uh, he likes yeah. most. So that that is already resonated. And then I took it uh, to a much more dirty place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Trading Virus. Uh, Wizzy Lizzy, go ahead. Lovely. Hello, thank you. Um, so I wonder if uh, you guys are looking at what uh, Abracadabra is doing with uh, providing liquidity pool uh, positions in order to mint stables. Um, I understand this is a very experimental thing and it won't be implemented anytime soon. Uh, but as a LP provider, it's an interesting concept, and I would like to hear uh, your ideas on the subject. I what have been looking into it, but I don't know that if I have intelligent thoughts, to be honest. I am not entirely sure that I fully understand the additional risks that this might be introducing. Um, I think it very much depends on the it depends on the pairs um, that are being added, um, but it's an interesting idea in terms of um, you know generating yield for stable coins, um, and um, I think that Babelfish have a different version of something like this that they're working on, where they would be able to, and I think you know they've been talking about this from the beginning that. Um, Babelfish can generate yields by lending out the underlying um, stable coins in the basket. And I know that they're also working on figuring out how they can earn yield because they're a cross-chain system on more than one chain um, using the same basket of assets. So I think there's some very interesting stuff that Babelfish are, are doing um, uh, in the background around that. Um, um, so maybe... Uh, they have, you know, thought more deeply about this than I have. Um, but, you know, I, I'm very interested in Abracadabra. So if uh, anyone wants to, you know, spend some time talking to me about it and, uh, uh, you know, explain to me in more detail, I haven't used the system. I've only just read about it. So I'd love to learn more. All right. Thank you very much, Wiz and Lizzie. Next up, we have uh, some previous speakers who have some follow-up questions. So Techie World. You waited so long. Go ahead, go ahead, buddy. Hey, uh, okay, so I was thinking about the same thing of lending. You can use that. Uh, uh, one question is that uh, 
does zero creates a contract on your address or there is a common pool where the all the btc is deposited there is a common pool um but well it's actually not a common pool um it creates a new smart contract um uh, vault for every user okay so what i was thinking that uh, we could use a common pool and uh, directly link it with sovereign's uh, margin trading system and provide extremely low interest rate yes it is possible to do that uh-huh. because we told this in one of the i think discord call i think this process i think i think that is a possibility I, um and um uh, i don't think it would actually be that complicated to do so i think it might be something that we see happen and that could provide very very attractive margin uh rates for users who come in with bitcoin collateral and uh, they can earn interest you told this uh, whole process in one uh, community call i guess yeah after community call we told yeah yeah um yeah so i do think that this is something that the zero team are moving towards and uh, you told that you are know, working on el salvador legal tender like what is the time frame we can expect well it's already legal tender right the dollar is already legal tender bitcoin is already legal tender um i think it's more a question of integrating with the different systems um i don't know what the time frame around that is um that those are for me yeah i mean those are some is given 1 month 2 month 1 year oh, i i i i i i i um i don't like to commit to timelines when i don't know with great detail what they look like okay and now uh, one more final question i don't understand like is zero is a fork of mint or how it's interacting because no. mint is using new coins so how it's again creating the duality what happens is that uh, zero so mint uses um it aggregates different um sort of sub stable coins right so like aggregated it, it aggregates different bitcoin stable coins or different methods of creating bitcoin stable coins so for example the zero uh, system when you're creating a loan um what it does is it sends a token called zusd to the mint protocol and then the mint protocol mints a new token on the basis of that okay so zero creates the zusd and that zusd is sent to mint protocol after that correct yes after that new coin is created that new coin is used by the user right? yeah so the user receives new coin they put in bitcoin they get new coin um and then they can trade take the new and uh, and trade it and buy with it or do whatever they want with it so what which coin would be majorly used is it zusd or new i think it, it would be new yes yeah, so um users users most users shouldn't have to uh touch Z- yeah touch the Z- 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 thanks thanks for playing sure all right next up we have moonkin go ahead yo guys <laughs> thank you for letting me come back on uh, shout out to my man wizzy lizzy for mentioning abracadabra Wizzy, Lizzy was the was a guy who got me first hooked on on Sovereign actually. So yeah, nice to see you. I know you're down in Bitcoin Beach, enjoying life. Anyway, uh, I wanted to ask. Yeah, Abracadabra is interesting, but have you guys? I mean, surely a lot of you have heard of uh, like the Olympus DAO um, concept and the, and the forks of Olympus DAO. I don't know much about them other than people seem to be you know. you know i mean people are pretty impressed either they're geniuses or pure you know defi degenerates like they hacked the entire like i don't know capital financial system like they seem to be some some found some kind of perpetual positive feedback loop i don't know like has anybody else heard about it or yeah Olympus have you guys heard about it it's a bit of both right so they've come up with some um with a with a with a very cool way of um getting people to to buy into their system um uh i think uh you know it, we could launch something similar um and i th- i've heard some people um like uh, david saroy 
for example, has been talking about doing something similar on Sovereign. Um, I think people should be aware of the risk, right? When you're buying mm. a um, when you're buying an, an OHM token, right, an Olympus token, you're paying a very, very, very high premium, about eighty percent above the actual sort of value of the underlying assets. Mm-hmm. Um, these kinds of things over time tend towards their um, sort of um, underlying asset value, but that can take a very long time. That can take years. So um, right now it's possible to still make quite a lot of money. Um, but uh, yeah, these are, these are, these are games, right? And people mm-hmm. should be aware of the fact that when you, Participating in a game like this, you know, it's not creating, you know, it's not a product that's generating revenue. It's a zero-sum game in a way that you're playing with other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Just wanted to hear what, what you guys might have thought about it. So, I, again, with the with the liquidity uh, questions and zero, of course. So, will there be a, I mean, is it a one-to-one of liquidity or will there be additional features like, uh, I don't know, like, the rates, for instance, are those um, equal? I think right now it's like twenty something percent on your um, uh, liquid liquidity USD into the stability pool, and uh, liquid liquid token staking. I think that's about like I don't know fourteen percent. I don't think it will be identical. No, uh, the tokenomics are different. The uh-huh. uh, um, the um, you know, the goals of the system are different. The upgradability of the system is different. But the underlying lending and minting uh, mechanism is very similar. Mm-hmm. It, like, can you share some other details on, like, what what uh, what differs from... Well, I think, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, it's an SOV bonded token, so it won't just be um, able to squirt out tokens, you know, uh, right. at a very, very, very high rate. Um, so... That will be one difference. Uh, Another difference is that it's an upgradable system, which is protected by both the zero stakers and the SOV stakers. Um, A third difference is that I know that they're looking to introduce new features like the ability to earn yield on your Bitcoin. Um, um, Potentially the ability to also take out loans against SOV. So... um, so I think, you know, these two projects will, while they share a lot of code, are evolving to different purposes. Another big difference is that um, Liquity, you know, is just one player of many in the Ethereum ecosystem when it comes to stable coins. Whereas with Zero, I think the idea is to turn it into the primary, um, or at least with Mint, right? The new token is to, is to turn it into the, primary stablecoin used by the Bitcoin ecosystem and by extension, maybe the world. Mm-hmm. So do, will there be staking of the zero token? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, we're almost two hours here. Uh, oh, wait, one more, one more, one more, one more. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, definitely do a space. It's a quick one. So, uh, w- uh, when we have DAOs, uh, you know, decentral- decentralized anonymous organizations working on open source code, and we're voting on improvement p- proposals and stuff like that in order to, you know, allow for somebody to to, to merge the code. Like, what's what's stopping developers from, you know, merging, you know, code anyway, and like uh, for, uh, you know, upgrading the system, um, e- even though, you know, the, the, the turnout of the votes turn out to be unfavorable or something like that. Like, how does the actual code merging and deployment work after a, a SIP has been, um, you know, completed? Sure. So to upgrade the smart contracts, you need to have the owners of the smart contract agree, right? So if one person owns a smart contract, they just sign the change. If there's a multi-sig, then, you know, a majority sign the change. But if you have something like Bitocracy, then the actual system that owns the smart contracts is the Bitocracy. And it only introduces changes that are voted, 
that are approved by the voting. So instead of having a multi-sig system, you have a system of voting and that actually the, the, the vote itself upgrades the system. Okay, so, so what you know transfers the, uh, the said protocol from one smart contract to the other? When a SIP is deployed, um, not all SIPs are like this because some of them aren't actually changing contracts. But when a SIP is deployed that changes a contract, you'll um, see that the, the devs will, will point to the, the new code. And when they actually list the SIP, when the SIP actually gets listed, um, it's a piece of code that says if this SIP passes, upgrade the system in this way. Um, so it's the code itself is what's being voted on and the code itself is voting on the change. Right. So, mm -hmm. so for example, you know, we could, we could have, for example, instead of having the exchequer, we could have, um, all of the funds held directly by the protocol. And then anytime we wanted to make a transaction, we would actually have to vote on that transaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it's a, a multi-sig um, transaction. Yeah. Well, it's not but a multi-sig. That's, that's the point, right? It's not a multi-sig. It's more sophisticated than a multi-sig. It's a bitocracy. It's literally the, uh, the, the vote itself is replacing a multi-sig. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I do some uh, web development in like the Web2 world, uh, you know, some microservices and stuff like that. So I haven't really, I haven't at all delved into smart contract uh, deployment, um, more or less used to like the continuous uh, deployment and integration um, pipelines that, that we most of us use to deploy decentralized infrastructure. Um, so this is like, you know, pretty interesting to me wonder if there's some way that uh, where I can learn more about like deployments and uh, upgrades and stuff like that um, pertaining to the well, questions that I, I think it, I think there may be something in the wiki about it but if not we should get someone to write something yeah or just somebody that I could uh, talk to maybe offline uh, in the discord um, sure you can um, you, there's a technical channel in the discord so you can you could post there and ask your questions yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I learned a little bit. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. Judas, maybe we should do just two more questions. Yeah, I think we have two last speakers here. We'll go with the real Benji who has an ask one and then we'll end with people who <laughs> has waited so long to ask another one and then we'll wrap it in. <laughs> go ahead. Cool. Um, hello. So I joined a little late. So if this question was already answered, uh, skip over me um so i'm just kind of trying to understand better how the uh, stable coin gets minted uh, does it does a lender have to be involved in this in this process or does it literally you deposit bitcoin into this mint and the mint uh, generates this uh, zero token and then <clears throat> when you want to um I guess, yeah, is, is that the process? So, so, no, there, there's no lender. Um, you are the lender. You're lending Bitcoin into the protocol, and the protocol on the basis of that is minting stable coins. Gotcha. And then the 110% like LTV is to kind of maintain liquidity. So if, if people want to get their uh, coins out, they basically can. There's no like solvency issues. <laughs> Uh, no, um, it's there. Well, it's not so that they can get their Bitcoin out so that people who have the stable coin can always redeem the stable coin on a one to one basis for, you know, one dollar's worth of Bitcoin. And gotcha. you to, yeah. OK. So no lenders. Gotcha. OK. <laughs> Thanks, Benji. Uh, people, go ahead. Hey, hi again, Eden. Okay, very, um, uh, very simple question. What is the zero token that is going to be issued soon used for? The zero token is used for governance of the zero sub protocol and also collects the revenue from the zero system. So basically, by participating in governance, you get paid. Um, and zero can potentially be a very, very profitable protocol. And so um, there could be quite a lot of value that accrues to zero stakers. Okay, thank you very much.
Awesome. Well, guys, thanks very much for spending so much time and asking all these questions. I think they were extremely helpful. I think we'll also try and use them to write up, you know, FAQs and things like this around and make sure that there's all of the, um, the information around zero is available. Zero sale is going to happen soon. I think it's going to be, you know, quite a cool event. It's going to be uh, a groundbreaking event. Um, and people who participate in it will be helping to bootstrap the zero system and the entire Bitcoin backed stablecoin system. But I think, um, you know, this is a really, really exciting opportunity uh, for us, but it's an important thing because I think it means nobody ever needs to sell Bitcoin ever again. So I hope, you know, there's you know, several hundred people who have joined this call. I hope you guys help spread the word, um, uh, help build out the initial liquidity um, help popularize uh, the new token um, on the sovereign platform and, and, and when it gets bridged to other places. And let's, uh, let's redefine uh, what decentralized stable coins are. Thanks very much, guys. Stay sober. Thank you very much, Iago. Thanks for the time. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great night. And don't forget to stay sovereign. Bye-bye.